Is Core's new Pace Pro kite worth 3,000 bucks? I'm gonna do a deep dive into how this kite performs and show you real data from the Surfer app so that you can decide for yourself. And if you wanna hear my thoughts, then just stay tuned until the end of the video. Meow. So in today's video, I'm gonna whiz through the technical specs, show you how it loops, jumps, its hang time, usability, talk about picking the right sizes and more. So let's shoot through the technical specs real quick. The Pace Pro is a three strut kite built with an Alula airframe and Cortex triple ripstop canopy. Nothing new on the canopy. Unlike every other core kite, it has no pulleys on the bridle, AKA it's got a fixed bridle. And Core had to make a new bar to make this design possible. Stay tuned until the end of the video to find out why you need the Sensor 4 bar with this kite. This kite was developed from the ground up. It's not a modified XR, but I will be comparing the kite to the XR to contrast some of the design features. It has a thinner leading edge than the XR. It's about 6.5% thinner than each XR in the same size. And it's got a tiny bit higher aspect ratio. It's two to 3% higher in the aspect ratio. So basically the same aspect ratio. It's got more surface area in the wingtips and a more gradual taper than the XR. Core has made the pace as light as possible without compromising on durability. Here are the weights of each size and the weights of both the XR8 and the XR Pro. I'm going to refer back to these technical specs and their effects in each chapter. So let's talk about loops. In this chapter, I'm going to talk about the pull from the loop, the catching speed and the bar pressure. Let's start out by looking at loops on each size I tested. Here's a loop on the eight meter. And here's a loop on the nine meter. And here's a loop on the 10 meter. As you can see, if you're looking for a big aggressive yank, this isn't the kite for you. Look at the pull from these loops. It gives gradual, constant pull. This is great if you want to progress at kite loops or add rotations or board offs to your loops. It's much easier to control than a loop with a big yank. You see, in order for this kite to win competitions, it needs to be able to do double loops. And you really want constant pull for that. Imagine this is you and this dragon is your kite. If you loop the kite and get yanked fast towards the kite, your front lines will go slack and that would cause the kite to stall. We don't want that. So if you want an aggressive pull, you're either going to need to get on short lines or pull the loops very early in the jump. The catching speed. Now the catching speed blows my mind. Look at how quickly the eight meter recovers on this loop. And look at how fast the 10 meter caught me on this loop. The size I'm most excited about is the 10 meter because it makes big kite loops safe and accessible in pretty light winds. So we can practice loops and loop variations and still get caught when it's only 15 to 25 knots. This is great one, because we don't always have access to strong wind and two, because crashing on an eight meter in strong wind hurts a lot more than crashing on a 10 meter in light wind. For example, this kite gave me the confidence to go for the Yannick loop on the 10 meter in my first session, which is crazy for me. I just didn't manage to get my foot back in the strap. Going for that trick on a nine meter XR scares the living shit out of me. Whereas the 10 meter pace has caught me on every single loop I've done on it. Every single loop. It even caught me super fast when I was looping at around five meters high. So I think I'm going to have some insane progress on the nine and 10 this year in Oman and Brazil. I can't wait. By the way, it still goes pretty high and I don't think you need to be a pro to get really good heights. What makes the kite catch fast is four things. One, the fast steering, thanks to decent surface area in the wingtips, this helps the wingtips act like rudders, steering the kite quickly through the air and helping it accelerate out of turns and loops. Two, the light weight, thanks to numerous weight saving decisions. Three, the fact that it's able to twist during turns and loops, thanks to there only being three struts, 
and four, the leading edge diameter, which greatly reduces drag and makes the kite super agile. Let's talk about bar pressure. Bar pressure is basically how much of the power comes through the front lines so that you feel the power in the harness and how much comes through the back lines so that you feel it in your hands. On a scale from I can't feel where my kite is to my elbows are hurting me, I'd put the Pace Pro right in the middle. The Pace flies more on the front lines than the XR and the XR pulls a lot through the back lines. The XR is notorious for having huge bar pressure which is awesome for getting feedback from the kite, but a lot of people find the too grunty and even get elbow pain from it. Too little bar pressure isn't good either because you don't get feedback in your hands about what the kite is doing. What I like about the pace is that it sits right in the middle of the spectrum, which makes it easy to handle and perfect for pushing your kite loops. So now what we all wanna know, how does it jump? If your takeoff skills are good, you can expect to jump 90% as high as you do on the XR. For perspective, I would say that a Nexus 3 jumps only 65% as high as an XR. I took the 8 meter pace and the 7 meter XR Pro for a boosting session at Misty Cliffs in about 30 to 43 knots. Starting with the pace, the highest jump was 23 meters. You can see my jump heights over here. If I exclude my aborted jumps, then my jump heights range from 14 to 23 meters, with my average jump height being 19 meters. I had seven jumps over 20 meters in that session, so pretty solid. Then I got onto the 7 meter XR Pro and noticed that the power felt pretty similar. If I had to compare the power of the 8 meter pace to the XR, I'd say that the 8 meter pace feels like what I imagine a 7.5 meter XR would feel like. On the XR, my jumps range from 14 to 21 meters high and my average jump height was 18 meters. The data would suggest that the eight meter pace jumps higher than the seven meter XR Pro, but I want to point out that I rode the pace for much longer in that session. I did eight boosts on the XR and I did a 26 boosts on the Pace Pro. I'm confident that if I'd ridden the seven meter XR Pro for longer and when I was still fresh earlier in the session, I would have gone higher on the XR than I did on the eight meter pace. But the fact that the heights were comparable demonstrates that the pace is definitely capable of doing some massive jumps. Now let's move on to other sizes. I haven't ridden the seven meter yet, so I can't comment on that. But judging by how the eight meter flies, I think it'll take at least 50 knots to get me on the seven meter. And if it's 50 knots plus, I'd rather be on an XR because it's got a more rigid airframe with five struts and it'll handle nuking winds better. The only time I'd rather be on a seven meter pace is if I wanted to do double loops, which I might want to do in the coming months. Let's see. I haven't taken the nine meter for a boosting session yet, but I have done some pretty big loops with it. My loops range from 11 meters high on the small ones to nearly 16 meters high on the big ones. Judging by how it's performed so far, I think I could take the nine meter pace to about 20 meters high with straight jumps if I was lit. I've ridden the 10 meter twice, and these were probably the funnest sessions I've had within the past year. When I was in 18 to 27 knots, I was typically jumping 10 to 15 meters off of the kickers. And in 15 to 25 knots, I was jumping nine to 12 meters high. Woo! I fucking love this site, guys. You gotta go honest, man. My friends, it's definitely worth $3,000 all year now, judging by how it's performed so far, I think I could take the 10 meter pace to about 16 or 17 meters high with straight jumps if I was lit. So pretty much across the board, I'd say I'm going about 90% as high as I would on an XR Pro, which is awesome, especially considering this is a looping kite. So since the Pace Pro jumps so well, you might be wondering whether you should be getting an XR Pro or a Pace Pro for jumping. Now, I believe that if you put an XR Pro and a Pace Pro in the exact same jump, at the same moment in time, in the exact same gust, the XR Pro will outclimb it every time. Don't get me wrong, the pace jumps high, but if you're looking for a kite to do the highest jumps of your life on, then you should get an XR. The truth is that any kite can go to the moon with the right gust, like this dude Eric on a year 2000 Nash ARX, who got caught on an updraft 24 years ago and still hasn't come down. But some kites will help you do massive jumps more easily and more frequently. The truth is that jumping with the XR is like cheating. No offense, but you can have really crap technique and still jump pretty high. You just need to ride a little fast, bring the kite up, 
pull the bar in and you're gonna fly. This is thanks to three things. One, the huge power and depower range of the XR, which it gets thanks to pulleyed bridles. So I've made markings on the bridles and I'm moving the kite around so that you can see how the pulleys move along the bridles. The result is that you can sheet your bar in and it will shoot you up into the air. Two, the distribution of the cloth in the canopy, which is focused in the top of the kite. And three, the way that the XR spreads its wings when you sheet the bar in, which is called intelligent arc. While we're on the topic of jumping, I want to point out one of the downsides of the Pacer's thinner leading edge and there only being three struts. The downside is that the airframe will have less structural integrity, so it's more likely to deform in nuking winds, which is why I think you should take an XR in nuking winds. So if you're looking for a kite that jumps 90% as high with insanely fast catching loops, you should get the Pace. I mean, check out this 20 meter high loop on the Pace. It caught me when I was probably 13 meters high. Also, I just want to say sorry to Stino for almost giving him a haircut on this crash landing. Woo -hoo -hoo. Weird. If my channel has positively impacted your kite surfing journey, then please consider shopping on BigAirKite.com. We stock most of the top brands, and I want to say thank you to our customers. Your support means the world to us. Hang time, landings, and glide. Now, the pace has pretty decent hang time. I think I would score at about an 8.5 in this category with an XR getting a 10. My longest airtime in all of my sessions was this jump with 10.5 seconds. Now for sure an XR would outperform this airtime, but honestly, the pace isn't far behind. So look at this jump on the seven meter XR. Look at how I get picked up during the heli loop. When it comes to smaller sizes like the eight and nine, I'd say I generally get a little bit less lift from the heli loops on the pace than I do on the XR. On the 10 and up, the heli loops are very floaty. Now look at how each of these heli loops lowers me down slowly, but don't really lift me up how the XR does. You can see that I get close to doing two heli loops, but the kite's not letting it happen. Now this is an area where the XR excels. The pace is capable of floaty jumps with multiple heli loops, but you've got to get lucky with the gust, like I did on this one. Multiple heli loops on the XR, on the other hand, are a regular occurrence and they're pretty repeatable. I must say that it is a bit more technical to land big jumps and loops with the eight meter pace than with the XR. So far, I've had a few more butt checks than I would normally have. But I'm sure that once I get dialed in on the kite, it won't be an issue. Now the hang time and glide gets better on the bigger sizes. Look at how I got picked up after this loop on the 10 meter and I always get butter smooth landings like this on the 10 meter. And lastly, on the topic of glide, you might be wondering how it performs at slides and old school tricks. It's pretty damn good. It's a little bit harder to get good pull out of slides and skis. Like when I'm doing my barefoot ski, the heli loop doesn't pick me up as well as it does on the XR, but it still works. I can definitely perform all of my old school tricks on it. So I would have no problem switching from the XR to the pace completely when it comes to old school. Build quality and durability. It's funny to me that I even need to talk about durability when we're talking about a 3000 euro kite. I mean, for fuck's sake, if someone's spending 3K on a kite, it better last at least as long as a regular kite. But as you probably know, the three strut Alula kite, which has been dominating competitions for the last while, is the Evo D-Lab. A lot of my students and friends use this kite and it breaks all the time. So I'm stoked to tell you that the pace is going to last you way longer and it's almost the same weight with the eight meter pace weighing in at 2.28 kilograms versus the eight meter Evo D-Lab weighing 2.2 kgs. Core's build quality and durability has always been amongst the best in the game. And I'm pretty sure that the new Pace Pro is going to be no exception. Why? Because it's built with the same construction and the exact same materials as the XR Pro. And the XR Pro hasn't had any issues. So which sizes should you get? Here's a table with what I think is the ideal use case for each size of the Pace Pro. The two main things you gotta know, an eight meter pace feels like a 7.5 XR and a nine feels like an 8.5 XR and so on. And that there isn't much sense in getting a seven meter pace unless you're under 70 kilograms or you want to do double loops. I'd pick a seven meter XR over a seven meter pace nine times out of 10. 
you can pause if you want to take a good look at the table. Now, I'd like to help you figure out your ideal quiver for your needs. Your quiver is obviously going to depend on your goals, the conditions you want to ride in, your budget, etc. I'm going to put out a video in the next weeks to show you how I choose which kites go in my quiver. So subscribe and ring that bell if you want to get notified when it comes out. For now, I'll give you a brief explanation. Broadly speaking, big air kites serve four different purposes. You get a kite to break records on, and your best options here are the 6, 7, or 8 XR. I've picked the 7 meter XR Pro. Then you get a kite to do huge loops on. Your best options are the 6, 7, or 8 XR, and the 7, 8, or 9 pace. I've picked the 8 meter pace. Then you get a kite to progress at kite loops on in moderate winds. Your best options are the 7 or 8 XR, and the 8, 9, or 10 pace. And lastly, you want to get your light wind kite to get out there when it isn't strong. It's always better to go too big rather than too small in your light wind kite. This can be any size over 10 meters. I normally use a 12 or 13.5 XR, but going forward, I'm going to be giving the 12 meter pace pro a bash, and I'll be sure to put out some content to let you know how the 12 meter pace pro performs. I hope that the info I've provided helps you pick the right sizes for your needs. Otherwise, you can use the live chats on BigAirKite.com to ask one of our Big Air Kiters for our advice. The new Sensor 4 bar. All previous models of core kites have pulleys on the bridles. These pulleys don't just alter the way the kite flies, but also how much the kite flags out when you pull your safety. Warning, do not use a Sensor 3 or older bar on the core pace. It will not flag out correctly. I know this doesn't look dangerous, but if my kite goes into the wind window, it will start death looping. Seriously, do not ride the pace with older bars or you will fuck yourself up. You need to use the beautiful new Sensor 4 bar. Some of my students and friends have been riding the Evo D-Lab with the Sensor 3S Pro bar because they trust this bar more than the Duotone bars. But the Sensor 3S bar will not flag out the Evo D Lab sufficiently. If you have a kite with a fixed bridle and you want to ride the core bar, you can ride the Sensor 4 bar with your kite. This bar is compatible with all kites and you can even change the split from a low V to a high V or Y split. I know it seems like I'm trying to roast Duotone here, but honestly, I'm just trying to educate more people and help everyone be safe out there. So to answer the question posed by this video, is it worth 3000 bucks? Now there's no right answer here. It's for each of us to decide. For me, hell yes. You can't get a kite this epic for cheaper. I think it's the best kite in the world right now for massive kite loops. And for me as a coach, when I'm teaching my students kite loops, I feel way more confident when we can go for the first big loops on a nine or 10 meter in moderate winds. And this kite unlocks that ability. But why is it so expensive? Canada. Canada just had to give us this expensive ass Alula, which is half the weight of Dacron and much stiffer and stronger. Thanks Canada for ruining kite surfing. But wait, this just in. There are labs in Asia trying to develop a competitive material. No one has gotten close yet, but we hope they will succeed. So you don't need to start an OnlyFans to afford massive kite loops. Now guys, if you've got any questions or anything to say, please drop them in the comments. If you found this video helpful, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. And otherwise guys, I'll see you in the next video. Muchos besos and adios.